Okay, so welcome all. It's a, a pleasure to. Muito bem, muito boa tarde, caros colegas. É um prazer revê-los de novo a todos presencialmente aqui. Veja a sala uh, regurgitar de gente. Please go ahead. Take your seats. Façam favor de tomar os vossos lugares. Ok, so we can start. Welcome. We are starting. Muito bem, vamos dar início aos nossos trabalhos. And 50th plenary session. Today is our first day and tomorrow is our second day. We will start with uh, my end of term speech. As you all know, today is the middle of the mandate, the five-year mandate, and uh, we will hold the elections for the new president. So first, before the speech, I would like to ask you if there are any objections for the adoption of the agenda. No. So the agenda is adopted. Would like to ask you for your approval of the minutes of the 149th plenary session that was held on the 27th and 28th of April 22. If there are no comments, the minutes are now approved. Dear colleagues, dear friends, two and a half years ago, I stood here before you, honored to have been elected your president. And together, we set one goal, to bring Europe closer to people. Remember back then, Brexit and the spread of populism was a wake-up call for Europe. Too many people felt the European Union was too distant, too complicated, too irrelevant to them. And then we faced one of the most unprecedented and tragic moments in our recent history, the pandemic forced us to close borders and close our economies. But during these challenging times, what we saw and what kept us going was the power of European solidarity. During the pandemic, we have seen neighbors cooperating across borders, looking out for each other. We have seen doctors and nurses fighting with all their powers treating millions of patients. We have seen scientists making every effort possible, delivering vaccines and saving lives. We back then called for an EU health mechanism to help us hire more medical staff, buy more medical devices and support our hospitals and our schools and the EU listened and delivered. And it was you, the presidents of regions, the mayors and the governors, the regional and local councillors from all across Europe who were there, first on the front line, first called upon to help your people and save lives, jobs and businesses. Thanks to science, 
but also thanks to you. We fought this fight, we stood up, and we will rebuild better than before. Dear colleagues, today I end my presidency with a war on our doorstep. We now face one of the worst humanitarian emergencies in Europe since the Second World War. And from the very, very first moment, we stood together with Ukraine. When we visited Polish and Romanian local communities, we saw that it was our regions welcoming, supporting, and protecting Ukrainian refugees. We launched an info support hub to support regions and cities help Ukrainian refugees. And tomorrow, here in our plenary, we launch an alliance of cities and regions for the reconstruction of Ukraine. We made the mayor of Kiev an honorary member of our house, and from the outset, we said that Ukraine's future is in the European Union. Because, my dear colleagues, Ukraine is not only fighting for its territorial integrity, but also for our common fundamental values. Ukraine's fight is our fight, the fight for freedom and justice. And in the end, our values will prevail. In the end, we will win this fight. Dear colleagues, dear friends, this tragic crisis of a magnitude unseen in a generation have tested the limits of our resources, our humanity and solidarity. But even during these dire situations, we came together demanding more from the European Union. We measured the impact of the pandemic on our regions, cities and villages in our annual regional and local barometers. We never stopped championing cohesion as an investment, but also a value in Europe, for every person, for every community. We listened to our young generation and science, and we put the climate emergency at the top of our agenda. We launched our green campaign going local, in addition to the many other commitments you and other members committed to growing 300,000 new trees. We reinforced our partnership with the European Commission to make our buildings energy efficient and accelerate zero pollution. We stood together in solidarity when so many communities were hit by natural disasters. And we are now launching an alliance on automotive regions as a tool to support a just green transitions that creates and protects jobs. And of course, the success of the green and the digital transitions needs research and innovation. And this is exactly the aim of the European missions, such as the cities' missions that many of you are part of. We also launched partnerships for regional innovation because Investing in innovation is not a luxury for our citizens and our economies. It is a necessity. Dear colleagues, if all these crises we are facing teach us anything, they teach us how important democracy is and how fragile it is. It is our responsibility to protect it. Local and regional democracy represent the very tools of democracy. Democracy was born in the grassroots, and we are the gatekeepers of this European democracy. And we will never turn a blind eye to any threat. This is why we launched a project on promoting European democratic values through education and we established the Pavel Adamovich Award to show that regional and local leaders 
will stand against all forms of extremism. We will stand against any form of populism. We will fight and we will win because democracy will prevail. Dear colleagues, when Chancellor Merkel, President Macron, President and Prime Minister Jansha and Prime Minister Costa attended our plenaries, their presence reinforced the message that we, the regions, cities and villages of Europe, we are the beating heart of the European democracy. Earlier today, along with President Metzola, who is our great ally, we planted an olive tree, the timeless symbol of peace and democracy. And tomorrow is the International Day of Parliamentarism, a celebration of parliamentary democracy. So my message today to the European institutions' leaders is clear. If you believe in a bottom-up Europe with decisions taken closer to the people, then we are your allies. But if you promote a top-down Europe, ignoring the grassroots levels, then we will never support this approach. European leaders and civil servants here in the EU must never forget that a distant, top-down Europe will never be supported by the level of government that is most trusted by the citizens, the local and regional leaders. Brussels and Strasbourg have one simple mission, to listen and to serve people. This is, after all, the essence of our union. This is the essence of our three-dimensional democracy. And this is the message that we all shared in front of thousands of regional and local leaders in Marseille in March this year. This is the manifesto of Europe's regions and cities. This is our manifesto. This is the voice of the people of Europe that was heard loud and clear throughout Europe. And dear colleagues, based on our proposals, citizens from all 27 member states have asked in the final report of the Conference on the Future of Europe for a stronger role of the local and regional authorities in the European Union in order to bring Europe closer to the citizens and at the same time to the realities of the ground with full respect of subsidiarity. And I encourage you here today, each and every one of our members, from today onwards, to start calling this House with a name that reflects our political mandate and our legal competences. Because, my dear friends, we are not just a committee and we are not representing just regions. We are the European Assembly of Regions and Municipalities. <laughs> dear colleagues, today we must be bold. We must change Europe and we must change it now. There is no time to lose. We need to make Europe stronger, more proactive, more effective, more open, more transparent and more democratic. And we will not stop. We will continue down this path, the path that we set together two and a half years ago. Dear colleagues, I am deeply honored to have served you these years, putting our citizens in the heart of Europe. Through our local dialogues, we have talked and we have listened to the people of Europe in city halls, regions halls, in libraries and universities, 
in conference rooms and in the streets in every corner of Europe. And we brought their voices in the heart of the European Union. And today, I stand here to say thank you. Everything we achieved was only possible because of your work on the ground and in this House. It was your commitment and dedication and with your cooperation that made it happen. And the sculpture that you have in front of you, Aristotle conversing with his student, Alexander the Great, in my region, in central Macedonia and Greece, is not only a way for me to show to you my appreciation, but is also a symbol to share the message that we have shown together in Europe. That European cities, regions and villages, through democracy and leadership, bring Europe closer to its people. And I have absolutely no doubt that my friend Vasco will continue to reinforce the foundations that we have built together. Best wishes, Vasco. We will all support you. And finally, I want to say thank you to our administration and all the amazing people who work in this House, as well to my close teams in the Brussels and in the Central Macedonia cabinets for putting regionally and locally elected members at the heart of our work. The European project, my dear friends, my dear colleagues, will only be credible by listening and acting for people. And you can count on me, on all of us, to deliver together for a united, just, green and cohesive Europe. A Europe that offers a better future for our younger generations. A Europe that is closer to its people. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you all for your trust and support. It has been for me a great honor. Thank you. You will allow me to offer, not to the new president, because this is something that you will decide Sorry. in the elections, <laughs> but to my first vice president, who has been of tremendous help throughout these two and a half very difficult years, a gift from my region as a token of my appreciation for his support and in memory of today's event that we had earlier down with the olive tree that we planted, a 100-year-old olive tree that I certainly hope will stay here for another two, three hundred years at least, so that you remember this bright day. And thank you very much, Vasco, for your support and everything that you have done to make this two and a half years mandate a success. Thank you.
Dear friends, dear apostles, I too have a small gift for you as a token of appreciation for your leadership during these two and a half years. The way you lead us through turbulent times, always bearing in mind the interests of local and regional authorities across Europe. My gift wants to symbolize a new frontier, the importance of this so many times forgotten resource that is the sea. I come from a region that is in the middle of the North Atlantic. So every time you look at this, it's not the box, it's what's inside it. Please remember the powerful, the power that lies in this new frontier. I have to open it. it yes. Okay. I think it's very, very well... Thank you very much, Vasco. I hope it is not a message that I need to get on a diet any soon. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, so, dear colleagues, we will now move on to the adoption of the electoral rules, and I invite the four youngest COR members that are present today to come to the podium as they will form the Interim Bureau along with the Secretary General and myself. I'm calling on Mr. Patrick Svarch Kiefer, Ms. Barbara Silvia Hegedus, Mr. Matthew Schwip, and Mr. Dovidas Kaminskas. So I now give the floor to the Secretary General to explain the electoral procedures, please. Secretary General. Thank you very much, dear President. You have, in, you have received a document concerning electoral rules. The elections are for the seat of the President, the seat of the first Vice President, the 27 vice president seats and 26 other members of the bureau. The seats for the bureau members are distributed as follows. Three seats for the most populated countries, Germany, Spain, France, Italy and Poland. Two seats for Belgium, Bulgaria, Croatia, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Greece, Ireland, Lithuania, Hungary, the Netherlands, Austria, Portugal, Romania, 
Slovakia, Finland and Sweden, one seat for Estonia, Cyprus, Latvia, Luxembourg, Malta and Slovenia. The elections of the member to the Bureau, except for the President and the first Vice President, includes the election of his or her replacement. The list of proposed candidates features in two columns in the document. On the left-hand side, you have the name of the full member, and on the right-hand side of the column, you see the name of the replacement. May I ask you now to adopt the election rules and to do it with the electronic voting. That's why we would also test our electronic system. So, can I, I now opening the vote. Can you please vote? So with this, the first, the rules have been adopted and also I'm very pleased to announce that we have the quorum. We have two and two 101 members present so that we can safely proceed towards the next points. Thank you. May I ask you, colleagues, to adopt the election, uh, the electoral rules and to do it with the electronic voting system to test it? Uh, we did it just now. So uh, if the quorum is reached, yes. which it was, uh, in accordance with the rules of procedures, conditions for voting have been fulfilled and there are a sufficient number of members present to proceed with the elections. So we do proceed to the elections, and I give the floor to the Secretary General to explain the procedure from now on. Thank you very, thank you very much, dear President. We are now moving to point five, the election of the President of the Committee, European Committee of the Regions. Mr. Vasco Ilidio Alves Cordero is the only candidate for the COR presidency. If you agree, we will proceed to the election by acclama acclamation. Thank you very much and congratulations. Dear President, if I may, to, uh, to, to move to point six. We are now moving to the point six, which is the election of the first Vice President of the European Committee of the Regions. Mr. Apostolos Tsitsikostas is the only candidate for the COR first Vice Presidency. If you agree, we will proceed once again with the election by acclamation. Mr. Tsitsikostas is the new first Vice President of the European Committee of the Regions, and I give floor to our new President for his newly elected uh, speech. Caro
dear first vice president, Apostolos Tsitsikostas, and vice presidents of the Committee of the Regions, dear presidents of political groups, president of the Legislative Assembly of the Azores, members, permanent representatives of Portugal to the European Union, Dear colleagues, Secretary General, this is the first time in which I am addressing you as President of the European Union's Committee of the Regions. So I would like to take this opportunity to share a friendly address with you, words of friendship and words of commitment. I hope to honour the trust which you have placed in me. And I shall do my utmost to serve in your interests to the best of my ability. I'm sure you will appreciate that since these are mere initial remarks uh, today, I have certain thoughts on my mind, certain references that I need to make. And the first of these is a tribute to Mr. Tsitsikostas. Fraternal greetings and gratitude for your work and leadership during what has been such a turbulent and indeed challenging period. The Committee of the Regions, and indeed I personally, have appreciated your dedication and your commitment to facing the challenges of the future. And the second reference that I would like to make is to the Parliament of the Azores. It is on uh, the basis of my role in the Parliament of the Azores that I stand as a representative here in the Committee of the Regions. It is thanks to the uh, Azores. It, I could not be here in the Committee of the Regions if I were not a representative of the Azores. The Azores are my homeland, my people, the region I have had the privilege to serve as President of the Regional Government. It is my honour to represent that territory in the Parliament. And the President, Luis Garcia, and the Regional Assembly of the Azores, Andrea Gosta and Alexandra Manos, Rui Martins, Gusalvo Aldas and Nuno Barata are all individual uh, politicians to whom I must pay tribute and thank for their role. Not only for what they've done in practical terms, but their symbolic importance to the Parliament of the Azores and to my region. Pedro Ruti, Ambassador. Your Excellency, Ambassador of Portugal to the EU, thank you for being with us. Uh, you have honoured us with your presence at this session. Times we are living in are demanding. Times like this put politicians, governments and institutions at all levels to the test. But these, all, these are also deeply challenging and exciting times. I would even say that for politics, in the broadest and, dare, I dare say, the most noble sense of the word, this is the time. Because of what is at stake, of the obstacles we must overcome, of the changes and transformations that we can and must drive. This happens not only on a global scale, in the face of challenges such as the climate crisis and the energy transition, but also at the European Union level with the war against Ukraine, its social, political and economic consequences, and even at the scale of our institution in what concerns how we see ourselves and how others see us, particularly within the context of the conclusions of the Conference on the Future of Europe. In this context, your choice to lead this organization fell upon me. A member 
of a parliament, of a regional parliament, a parliament of an island region, archipelagic, outermost region, halfway between Europe and America. More than on my possible merits, this choice says a lot more about this institution, its members, and the political and institutional significance of this decision by the European Committee of the Regions. And if much can be said about this, there is one thing that is worth repeating. With this choice, the Committee of the Regions not only proclaims, but also bears witness to a, to a Europe that is done by everyone, for everyone for every town, city, or region in Europe, no matter its size, no matter its location. With your decision, the Committee of the Regions underlines and gives political testimony to the importance of political assemblies, regional political assemblies, and asserts in the clearest of forms that everyone can, on equal terms, aspire to be a part and the protagonist of the European dream. And in these turbulent times, when so many people in so many places fight to emphasize what divides us, I see this election as a way of recognizing once more the strength of what unites us, despite what may depreciate us. Chers collègues, je viens de vous décrire le we find ourselves in a context which is a stepping off point from my presidency of the Committee of the Regions. We are still going through a pandemic which directly or indirectly is throwing into flux the lives of millions of people. This pandemic has also showed a major fracture in the lives of our communities. It was also a test for our institutions and our political, sociological and economic communities. Since the beginning of the year, we've been, we've had a, we've been experiencing a tragedy as we've never seen before as well on our continent, on our continent war. A barbarous military aggression on the level of which, of which the European Union was founded as a result of. This is a rupture in our lives, both socially and economically. Pandemic, war, in both cases, regions, cities and villages in Europe have risen to the challenge and have responded, showing solidarity, mutual assistance and recovery on the ground to the limits of their powers and resources to help our fellow citizens, families and businesses in each community with measures that could not only help save lives but could help save and recover jobs, businesses, income. Measures that helped ensure that after the storm passed we could still have a future. In the of the brutal military invasion of Ukraine, it has been and still are the regions, cities and towns of Europe, in particular those of the countries closest to the conflict zone, which promptly made shelter for refugees, opened buildings and mobilized resources to take them in and protect them, and at the same time, in an impressive show of solidarity have supported those who have stayed behind in Ukraine to fight for their homeland and to, we should never forget it, to fight for the freedom of us all. Similarly, it is the region, cities and towns of Europe that are at the forefront of the support for Ukraine's integration process into the great European family as is clear from the resolution adopted by this committee at the last plenary session, with a rich awareness of what this means for every single one of us, but also with the realization that the Ukrainian authorities know exactly 
what this requires from them as well. Yes, we want to support our Ukrainian partners now and in the future for the reconstruction. This is why we are launching the Alliance for Ukraine during this plenary. But the context that surrounds us in this second part of the mandate also brings challenges that are already known to us, even if they take, an, take on a greater sense of urgency. That's the case of the climate emergency and the need to reaffirm and act immediately for the green and digital transitions. Here, too, either by their direct competences or because their action can make a difference, for better or for worse, it is important that rec to recognize that is the regions, the towns and cities that are at the forefront of these fights. Caras e caros colegas. Colleagues, above and beyond the situation which I've just described, which goes beyond the scope of our own action. There is another dimension which relates to political action that I think I need to refer to today as we look at what the Committee of the Regions will be doing up until 2025. I'm referring to the conclusions of the Conference on the Future of Europe. There is a real challenge there to take action, to be credible and to justify the trust placed in the EU institutions. The Committee of the Regions has played an active role in the work of the conference, and the Committee of the Regions has had and still has a very clear position on these issues. We're doing the groundwork, indeed, in order to vote on the, a resolution on this new stage at this very plenary meeting. So this is the right time to speak out on these issues. Nonetheless, I think however obvious something is, it is appropriate to, to say it out loud anyway. If you're going to ask citizens to take, place in, take part in the political process, if you're going to say we're going to have participation, we're going to let you give input into where the EU should go, then after that, you can't say, oh, well... Sorry, no treaty change. You know, we can do it. We can't do that. Thanks very much for your ideas, but we can't do that. No, we have entered into a commitment to listen, and citizens have placed their trust in us. So the credibility of the entire process will be at stake if we cannot show good faith and deserve that trust. Of course, such a process is a complex one. I'm not burying my head in the sand about that. This next stage that the EU is going to go through, especially taking account of recent events in some member states, is not going to be an easy ride. And we've also seen that some parties in this process have been trying to achieve their own political gains for instance, with a view to the uh, European Parliament elections of 2024. But I think we need to keep our heads clear as to what our aim is. It is what we said at the beginning. We set the rules of the game when we started, and we can't move the goalposts just as we come towards the end of the match. So there may be complaints and frustration, but... On the 23rd and 24th, the Council addressed the conclusions of the Conference of Europe. Given the complexity of the context in which we find ourselves, how is the Committee of the Regions positioned and how should we position ourselves to move forward? It is certain that we have our political priorities adopted, in which we fully recognize ourselves. But if we can point out two or three aspects that seem decisive in the future action of our institution in the face of this reality that surrounds us, I would first like to mention that what the present times require is a stronger and fairer Europe for all. 
a stronger Europe that advances exactly from the unapologetic affirmation of its values and foundational principles, such as freedom, the respect for human dignity, tolerance, the rule of law, and democracy, among others. Here, exactly in this last component, this means first a strong internal democracy resultant from greater proximity and better information to our fellow citizens. A stronger democracy with more transparency resulting not only from procedures but also from objectives and purposes. A stronger Europe that is also based on promoting greater and systematic citizen participation in the decision-making processes. This is ultimately particularly important in the light of the conclusions of the Conference on the Future of Europe. But above all, in the light of the rich political heritage that regions, towns and cities have in promoting mechanisms for citizen participation. We will overcome the challenges that the current context poses to us also by advocating for a fairer Europe for all. Underpinning this call for a strong commitment for the social dimension in Euro of Europe in the way it is expressed in the Porto Summit commitment, adding particular attention and focus to social issues in all areas. A stronger and fairer Europe for all cannot exist without empowering women in our societies and within our political bodies. 2025 is the year that the European Commission set to make significant progress towards a gender equal Europe. I think we can and we must do better. A stronger and fairer Europe for all cannot exist without addressing the discrimination against LGBTIQ people across our continent. Making our, all our cities and regions LGBTIQ freedom zones would not only be a political sign but also brings protection, respect and hope for everyone. But we must never forget that a stronger and fairer Europe for all also means that besides all that, the EU also pays attention to the need to create jobs, to help families access education and health. That is side by side with the European citizens about addressing their concerns over the future safety of their families, their kids, their elders, their jobs or their communities. Dear friends, this stronger and fairer Europe for all, which is achieved on European soil, cannot and must not reduce its reach and should also be assumed as a beacon of values and principles throughout the, the world. Last Friday, the world was reminded that there are values and principles that we can never take for granted. So we must also take as a priority of our action the defense of a stronger and fairer Europe for all because it means the construction of a society here in our continent that prefers bridges to walls, that prefers the unbearable lightness of freedom to the agonizing weight of oppression. A Europe that in essence fulfills its citizens' aspirations and those of others that share, share the same values in a world that so badly needs it. A second imperative that the current context impels the Committee of the Regions to take on has to do with the need for the firm, unequivocal and uncompromising defense of a cohesion policy that potentiates and supports economic, social, territorial and environmental cohesion. Cohesion policy is a pillar of the implementation of the European project. But the truth is that for some time now, it has been seen by some just as a set of resources that without any hesitation can be directed to other topics and put to serve other goals. This entails the real and present risk of cohesion policy being seen only as a budget available on the short term to address any emergency and not as a policy to support medium and long-term objectives. 
Cohesion policy has been instrumental in fighting against the immediate social and economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it is providing support to people fleeing the war in Ukraine. But we must not lose sight of what the policy is about, a long-term investment policy to support the European model of society based on territorial cohesion and the reduction of regional disparities. The dilution of cohesion policy in the post-2027 multi-annual financial framework is a risk that should not and cannot be overlooked. The Committee of the Regions must therefore hold this ground in the defense of a policy which has still much to give for achieving the idea of leaving no one behind, that is, the Union's own ideal. To this end, let us all know how we can work to update its objectives so that, properly equipped and with the necessary resources, it can fulfill its role of building and achieving our Union. From our side, the work on the future of the cohesion policy starts here and starts now. Dear colleagues, we have a third priority, which has to do with the very functioning of the Committee of the Regions, how we see ourselves and how we are viewed. Everyone, everyone across the European institutions praises the local and regional dimension of the European Union and the European democracy. But few seem available and committed to recognize this institution as a true political assembly, the assembly of local and regional authorities of the European Union. It is therefore time to stress the political profile of this institution, battling misunderstandings and ignorance, bearing in mind that the vastness of the areas which this statement can and should cover is equal to the potential that remains to be made as to the decisive contribution that Europe's local and regional authorities can make to its implementation, for its renewal, for its perpetuity. And what we need to make clear is that we are not and cannot ever turn a blind eye to these concerns. We need to be extremely clear. En Colleagues and friends, by way of conclusion, we're listening to the voices of thousands of local and regional communities. Their voices are represented here in this assembly, which represents the voices of thousands of elected officials. And so on behalf of the Committee of the Regions, to the Parliament, to the Council, to the Commission, without forgetting our sister institution, the Economic and Social Committee, I would like to offer our hand. We will be ready and willing to work together to commit to improving and implementing the European project, which is going through difficult times, but is which is always a sign of hope and trust and hope in a better future. Done. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we proceed to point now number nine. It's the election of the vice presidents and the other bureau members. You have received a list of 53 names presented by national delegation to be appointed as members of the bureau. This list adheres to the allocation of seats to countries. The list of candidates is available on the members portal. 
Only a few names are missing as replacements for the Bureau members, but the, those ones will be appointed later and in another plenary session. So if we are prepared, I propose to the plenary that the plenary assembly votes by acclamation the list that was presented to you. The list is adopted. Congratulations to the new Bureau members. So, moving to point number nine, the adoption of the list of names of political group chairs as members of the Bureau. Um, may I remind you that the presidents of the political groups are also members of the Bureau. Also, this list is available on the members portal. So, I would like to congratulate all newly elected members of the Bureau and inform you that the first meeting of the new Bureau will be held on September 16th in Prague. You will soon receive the invitation letter and some practical information concerning this meeting. Now, I think we have the anthem. Okay. Mr. Geblevitz, you have the floor. Dear Mr. President, uh, on behalf of an EPP uh, group, the biggest political family in our political assembly, I would like to cordially congratulate you and all newly elected bureau members. Uh, I'm more, uh, I'm certain that we will ha have a really fruitful cooperation. And in this place, I would like to honestly and cordially and personally thank our president and our friend, uh, Apostolos Tsitsikostas, uh, who was recommended as a president, I would like to remind you, uh, for, by the EPP group. But I think that I can... Thank you on behalf of all our members in this political assembly. As it was said, you had to lead our assembly in extraordinary, extremely hard times. And you did it firmly, decisively, and on the other hand, you made our committee more respected. So I would like to thank you for all the special guests we had during our plenary, not only from Brussels institutions, but also head of states. Uh, I, I, do, I would like to thank you for your enormous achievement uh, building our strong position during, during conference on the future of Europe. And it will be your legacy, and I hope that together with the new president we will follow it. I would like to thank you that you are not only present right here in Brussels, but you will, you, you were uh, present in our regions, in our cities, in our villages, promoting our committee of regions in every corner of Europe. Thank you very much once again. It was great job done. All the best for you, and once again, best wishes for a new elected president. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gravlevitz. Mr. Rouillon, vous avez la parole. Mr. Rouillon, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. This is a big moment today, a moment for transition, for change within our Committee of the Regions. It's also a symbol of the uh, political agreement we came to at the beginning of our mandate, which all political groups agreed upon. So this is evidence of our maturity that we have reached now and the respect that is given to our committee. Thank you very much, Apostolos, for your work. I've gotten to know you as a member of the Committee of the Regions, and I think your work has been excellent. We 
were brought together. We got to meet with local people, with representatives of local and regional authorities, with members from the media. You have always been a flag bearer for the Committee of the Regions, not just here in Brussels, but also in your own region. I think that will be the legacy for your work, so congratulations on that. Now, you spoke about Aristotle, of course, one of the major philosophers of Europe. I would like to reference someone who said that courage is what is always needed for Europe to move forward. And I think that you have always shown courage, and I think Basco will do so from here on out as well. He'll take up where you've left off. So we're not just a small technical assembly. We are a political assembly. We are a European assembly for regions and for municipalities. And that's what we want to see. We have a clear message to send out to people. We are the link between the institutions at European level and the citizens. We can carry messages from one to the other. We can also highlight areas where Europe should have more competences, where Europe should work more. And that should, of course, fall under the work of the Conference of Future of Europe as well. We need to call on uh, Ms. von der Leyen to uh, fully implement what she said during her uh, speech on the future of the Union by working with the Committee of the Regions and by giving us additional competences where we can act. So thank you very much to Apostolos and all the very best of luck to you, Vasco, for your upcoming term, which I think will be all about construction and development, a stronger, more social and integrated Europe. Thank you. Chief Christoph, our colleague Lender Green, you have the floor. Tack så mycket och då ska jag passa för på att för Renew gruppen också tack Thank you very much. Uh, speaking on behalf of Renew Europe, I would like to thank you for this term of two and a half years. You are an extraordinary pair. Firstly, I would like to turn to our outgoing president. I would like to thank him for his work. It's been a difficult uh, period, but you will have the support of our new president for the two and a half years to come. It's been quite a while that I've been a member of the Committee of the Regions now, and I can honestly say that you have allowed us to step up our work. You've increased the rhythm and the momentum here. You've done what you spoke about doing for years. You've increased our visibility. Today, we have a lot more influence. And so it's uh, much more enjoyable, I think, to work in the Committee of the Regions today, even though we've had to work remotely a lot. All the same, we've been able to focus more on local and regional issues. And we have many examples from our regions, things that will allow us to improve, things that will allow us to uh, make better legislation as well. So thank you very much for all the work that you have done and all the very best of luck for your future work, which I'm sure will be carried out together. We'll follow it up uh, closely in order to make our committee all the more visible. Thank you. Mr. Marsilio, you have the floor. Grazie, signor President. Thank you, President. The European Conservatives and Reformist Group would like to thank the outgoing President Apostolos Tsitsi Costas and wish the incoming President Vasco Corredo every success. I know that we have entered into a commitment that means that the two of you will continue to be the uh, power duo working together for a better Europe. The role of the regions and local authorities has been enhanced during these years of crisis. Both the EU institutions and national institutions have realised the extent to which it is regions and local communities that are at the forefront of facing the consequences of events such as a pandemic or a war between Russia, Ukraine, incoming refugees. It's the frontier Regions, the border regions, who are in the, in the front line here, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, Romania, elsewhere in Europe too. But it is, of course, 
these border regions who've set the example for us. They are an inspiration to us as to what European solidarity can mean, what it can mean to step up to the plate when there is an emergency. And sometimes there are stereotypes about national governments of countries bordering Russia and Ukraine. They've been subject to such national stereotypes in the past, and we've overcome that, as I see when we've seen this inspirational uh, behaviour. So, Mr Tsitsi Costas, Mr Corredo, you can count on our full support in your new roles. We'll be honest, we'll be loyal, and I hope that we'll be able to make a contribution through our opinions and through the positions we adopt as Europe moves forward and builds our future. Thank you and good luck. Colleague Carl van Looy, you have the floor. Van Looy. Thank you all, Voorzitter, dear Vasco. Ook een namens ons. Thank you very much. On behalf of our group, the European Alliance, and on behalf of the regions we represent, we would like to congratulate you on your election as President of the Committee of the Regions. This is, of course, a big honour, we would imagine, to be able to uh, represent this committee, given our increasing importance as well. We've gone through a difficult period, uh, COVID, of course, as you mentioned, under the presidency of Tsitsi Costas, the pandemic started, and now we're at the end of one term, at the beginning of the other, and we're experiencing a horrific war in Ukraine. So you can count on our full support and constructive cooperation during your term. You are from an island area. We have many people in our own group who represent similar regions, islands throughout the European Union, and we certainly hope we'll be able to uh, cooperate well during your term in our group as well. To Vice President Tsitsi Costas, now I would like to congratulate you on your excellent work and the excellent cooperation that we had with that you had with the various different groups during your term of office. You uh, yourself visited many different regions, very many different uh, municipalities and cities throughout Europe during your time, including places in Flanders, and hopefully we can continue to organize such visits. You experienced very difficult circumstances during your term, and you always highlighted subsidiarity. That's something that's really important to us. You also always highlighted diversity within the unity that we have at European level. And I hope that the cooperation, the excellent cooperation we had with you will continue now with the new president. We'll work together in order to make sure that the Committee of the Regions can continue its work and increase its importance and visibility. Thank you. Now I give the floor to our colleague uh, Nina Ratilainen. You have the floor. Kiitos puheenjohtaja, arvoisat kollegat. Thank you very much, um, Mr. President, uh, colleagues. On behalf of the Greens, I would like to thank you for your excellent cooperation, for all your work, uh, Mr. Tsitsikostas. You really succeeded in highlighting European cities and regions. And you've helped to build a, a more optimistic future for us. We've gone through various different challenges, the pandemic, we've got the climate crisis, we have the Russian aggression as well. Despite all of that, the work continued. And despite all of that, you have uh, steered this ship, always highlighting unity on behalf of Europe when faced with these crises. And our villages and regions have also done everything they could in order to uh, overcome these challenges and to strive for a better future. So congratulations to our new president. I would like to thank you in advance for the cooperation with the Greens group. 
we've only been around for two and a half years, but I'm sure that our cooperation will continue from here on out, and I would like to thank you in advance for that. Thank you very much for highlighting the climate crisis in particular and the situation that minorities are going through, particularly the LGBTIQ community. All the best of luck. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have the indication that we are all invited to take a family photo. And after the family photo, we'll have the U e EU uh, anthem. So let's do it. I don't. You don't have to. You don't have to move from your. Just if you want, stand up. 